Welcome everyone. We have now come to a topic that has been the interest of many for quite some time. And this relates to the origin of races and the evolution of language. But before we get into the meat of this, what I want to do is tell you the story first. Then we will examine a few things and get into the reality of the subject. And so we will begin with the most common version of the tale told in Genesis. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now after hearing this story, how many of you feel that there are quite a few details missing here. There is no detailed description of the city or the tower in these particular verses. So why do we have countless renderings of a spiral or temple-like structure? Journey with me as we explore history and the many questions related to this scripture as we search for the truth behind the Tower of Babel. So before we get into whether the Tower of Babel or Babel was real or not, let's try and understand what went down in the context given. And for that, we need to go back to the origin of our species, the first man and woman. And if we go by the biblical narrative, that would be Adam and Eve. We would all be descendants of those two people. Now, we all know what intermarrying and incest is. And we know and understand that this was allowed or sanctioned in those times. This didn't change until around the time the Israelites were wandering the desert and getting ready to enter Canaan, where God told Moses to lay down the law about this. Now going back to Adam and Eve, they had a bunch of children who have children and so on. What happened was the intermarrying between close relatives and all that was going to come to an end. However, due to the fallen angels and the defilement of mankind and creatures, it became a free-for-all, and everybody was hooking up with anybody and anything. Too much corruption and too many abominations. Up until the days of Noah, when God had to wipe the earth clean of this mess. And after the flood, we see the population reduced back to eight. Now, you can't do much with that many people, so the intermarrying begins again. Here's the problem. After some time, the people came together at Shinar and said, Listen, let's build this city and this tower, which essentially was an astrological worship site. 
And they said, let's just keep ourselves contained here. We don't need to spread out. We can stay here and do our thing with each other. So God divided the languages. He confused them so that they couldn't understand each other. Everyone became a babbling idiot, I guess. And then they were pushed away from each other. Voila, we have diversity. That's my short take on it, but there's more. So how much diversity are we talking? Well, in Genesis 10, there is a table of nations that lists 70 nations. So let's consider a few things here. One, the people in those days were not idiots. They had technology, mathematics, they knew about the stars, geography, metallurgy, architecture. There is no way they thought they could build a tower that would actually reach the heavens. What this tower most likely was is what's called a ziggurat or step pyramid. And a ziggurat back then could be comparable to an observatory today. Keep in mind that this is the beginning of Babylon, ancient Sumer. And what did they believe? They believed that these beings came down from the heavens called the Anunnaki. And that story of beings coming down from the heavens could have only come from Noah's family, right? So with this idea in their heads, they thought it would be a good idea to build a space station or observatory or a ziggurat or a tower of Babel so that they could do what? Did they want to create a way for those beings to come down and start that mess all over again? Maybe it's not that they wanted to reach the heavens, but they wanted beings from the heavens to reach them. Do you see why God would confuse them? Not only would it divide them and force them to spread out, but it would devalue and divide the worship of these deities coming down from the heavens. Maybe. Or was it Nimrod's rebellious attempt to prop himself up as a god? And there is, of course, the story of Nimrod challenging God. Now, the tower, which some believe was named Entamananki, wasn't just a ziggurat. It was also a monument, a symbol of identity. They wanted a name for their new kingdom. Some believe that the name they are talking about is Shem. They wanted a marker, something to establish their kingdom as the kingdom before they begin to spread out amongst the face of the earth. So who was Nimrod? Well, to understand who he was, or who he might have been, we need to go back to Noah. See, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. According to Moses, there were Nephilim in the days before the flood and after, which leads many to speculate that somehow, some way, the genetics of the Nephilim had survived. So how? Well, many biblical scholars suggest that it was Ham's wife who carried on the Nephilim gene, okay? Because the wives of Noah's sons were not from his direct lineage, would it make sense that the fallen angels would want to sneak aboard the ark one of their own? Remember that the giants after the flood were known to be just men of superhuman strength and ability. They stood tall like Goliath whose lineage links to Gath and back to Ham. I mean, Ham's sins and his lineage since the Ark, it's a bit complicated. The point is, Nimrod was the son of Cush, and Cush was the son of Ham. And just in case you were wondering, yes, it is believed that Ham and Shem were darker in complexion than Japheth. And of course, Noah was much lighter in complexion. Some speculate that maybe he had albinism. Either way, when you look at where his sons settled, the characteristics of the people in these areas, it could make sense, right? But while you're thinking about that, here is what I want you to consider. When it comes to angelic principalities and powers, in these nations around the world, there seems to be a position, a position of power that is handed down by blood, by lineage, even in the states. That may be why there seems to be some lineage or connection between past presidents of the US. So if there is some angelic position of power held by these entities that they would give great kingdoms over to their genetic descendants, then that may explain why Nimrod is also known to be the god King Osiris. At least that is one take on it. 
as some suggest that this is the same person as Gilgamesh. How many of you remember a few years ago, actually it was back in 2015, something about the tomb of Osiris being discovered. See the story was they had unearthed a replica or model of the mythical tomb of Osiris. Now, I know that sounded a bit weird and here's why. If you have a story of this mythical tomb and then afterward you go digging and find the tomb, then it's not a myth. Am I right? You know they've been looking for this tomb since the 1800s. They say they found it and then they say, oh, that's not it. Then they don't want to show you any photographs, maybe just a few. Then they just want to give you and I descriptions. We don't really know what they've found in those tombs. Now the death of Osiris, the story of his brother, set chopping his body into pieces and then spreading the remains along the Nile and land. Could that be a retelling of the story of Nimrod's death found in the book of Jasher? Here's what it says. And on a certain day Esau went into the field to hunt and he found Nimrod walking in the wilderness with his two men. And all his mighty men and his people were with him in the wilderness. But they removed at a distance from him, and they went from him in different directions to hunt. And Esau concealed himself from Nimrod, and he lurked for him in the wilderness. And Nimrod and his men that were with him did not know, and Nimrod and his men frequently walked about in the field at the cool of the day, and to know where his men were hunting in the field. And Nimrod and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were, when Esau started suddenly from his lurking place, and drew his sword, and hastened and ran to Nimrod and cut off his head. And Esau fought a desperate fight with the two men that were with Nimrod. And when they called out to him, Esau turned to them and smote them to death with his sword. Also apparently, according to the book of Jasher, Nimrod had possession of the garments that God had made for Adam and Eve. And it reads, And the garments of skin which God made for Adam and his woman, when they went out of the garden, were given to Cush. For after the death of Adam and his woman, the garments were given to Enoch, the son of Jared. And when Enoch was taken up to God, he gave them to Methuselah, his son. And at the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them to the ark, and they were with him until he went out of the ark. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah his father, and he took them and hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begat his firstborn Cush, he gave him the garments in secret, and they were with Cush many days. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up. And when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. And Nimrod became strong when he put on those garments. And when Esau saw the mighty men of Nimrod coming at a distance, he fled and thereby escaped. And Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod's father had bequeathed to Nimrod and with which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land, and he ran and concealed them in his house. You know, this story of the Tower of Babel, you could look at it from so many different angles. It is pretty much the story of the quick rise and fall of the first kingdom. I mean, that flood didn't happen too long before that, but it seems they wanted to go right back to the ways of the old world. And with the vision of languages, there is the vision and variations of the stories about this place. They end up becoming nothing more than legends, but for us it could be just ancient history. So with some of this information on the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, I believe all of this will make more sense when we study more of the ziggurats that existed in these ancient kingdoms and some that exist today. That's going to take a whole other video. Also. Do we still have groups of individuals still worshipping the likes of these ancient Egyptian and Babylonian gods or god kings? I will discuss this a bit more as it relates to other topics. So there is more to come. 
Until next time, everyone, take a look into this. See what you find. Share some of your thoughts.